Good evening, everyone. It's Ross up here in the red T-shirt. Well, I don't know where you are on your screen, but I'm on the top left of my own screen. Um, thank you for joining me this evening. Um, I hope you're well. Uh, half term for many of you. Before we get started, I'm going to introduce uh, who I'm with. Um, you're all experts at all this kind of, um, you know, talking online at the moment. So if you can just mute your microphones, your side, you can pose questions through the chat box and then we'll post them either on your behalf or respond to them publicly. And um, if you can be conscious of your backgrounds, you know, small children, those types of things, I would be grateful. This video is getting shared on YouTube uh, and also on my blog. So if you can just do um, those things your side, um, that'd be appreciated. Um, I'm just going to share a couple of uh, images. Uh, so first of all, I'm just going to start with uh, where you are all watching from. Um, so this is just a picture of uh, through my newsletter. So we've got, uh, I think I didn't actually count the countries, but we've had about nearly 500 signups, probably about 20 countries there. So it'd be interesting to know um, why uh, uh, and who you are from those different regions. If I just um, show you the UK map, so that's where you're all located here in the UK. We've got one or two colleagues joining us from Scotland and Wales. So thank you to everybody for joining in. Um, I'll go straight it down to business. I'm going to ask each of our hosts um, just to say who they are, what the role is. Um, so, you know, you, you all know me, so I'm going to just kind of skip introductions here. I, I work alongside Mark Cooper at GK. Um, Mark, I don't know if you want to just say anything, but Mark's doing all the admin and chat box behind the scenes. Uh, so he's giving me a nod, he's going to pass. Um, so if I hand over to uh, the Education Endowment Foundation, to Robbie first, and to Emily, just to say hello to everybody. Hi, Ross. Um, really good to be here tonight. My name is Robbie Coleman. Um, I work at the Education Endowment Foundation and I'm part of the, the team setting up the National Tutoring Programme. And to Emily? Yeah. Hi there, everyone. Sorry, I was a bit on the sl bit slow on my unmute button. Um, but yeah, good to see everyone. I'm Emily Yeomans. I'm also from the Education Endowment Foundation and I'm working on the National Tutoring Programme Tuition Partners Pillar. And um, over to Yulani, Teach First. Yulani, hello. Good evening. Hi there. Hi. Um, so yes, I'm Yulani Vignesvaran. I'm the Head of Academic Mentoring at Teach First and uh, really grateful to be here tonight to talk to you all about the, the Academic Mentoring Programme. Okay, thank you, Yulani. And to Liberty and then to Jack. Hi. Hi, Liberty. From the <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm Liberty. I also work at the... And to Jack. Jack Sorry, I think I'm having some internet issues. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll crack on and we're going to bring everyone in. Um, Mark, um, Liberty and, and Jack, well, we're all going to be responding to all the questions in the chat box. Um, so fire them over in that side. Um, I'll go straight into our kind of first question. So who's involved? So if I bring um, perhaps Robbie, then Emily, then Yulani in, uh, just to kind of kick things off. Could you give us a brief overview uh, for everyone watching? What is the National Tutor Programme all about? Absolutely. Thanks, Ross. Um, so the National Tutoring Programme is um, a, a, an initiative that's been set up by a group of charities um, to support schools in, in, in responding to the impact of, of the pandemic on learning. Um, so the EEF, um, which is the, the charity I work for, did, did a piece of research um, right um, back in, in April. And, and what we identified was um, that the pandemic was likely to, to, to widen the attainment gap between um, students who are eligible for free school meals and their peers. Um, and actually that the, the magnitude of that impact might be large enough um, that it reverses the, the progress we've made as a system um, narrowing the gap over the last decade. Um, so the question was what we could do about that. Um, and and um, so we looked at the evidence on, on, on what are some of the most effective um, approaches that, 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 that uh, we know um, are out there according to the evidence base um, and tutoring comes really near the top of that list. And, and so the National Tutoring Programme is an effort to increase the availability of of, of high quality tutoring and to make that available to as many schools um, and in particular disadvantaged students as, as possible um, over the next academic year. Okay, is there anything to add, Emily, before I hand over to Yulani? Yeah, so just specifically in terms of the tuition partners pillar. So the tuition partners pillar is about getting uh, external high quality tutors into school. So we know obviously the, the thing that's most important for improving the attainment of pupils is quality first teaching. But through the tuition partners pillar, we want to support schools by bringing in 
additional kind of capacity to support pupils and take some of the burden away from schools in terms of assessing quality by the team at the EF doing a kind of quality assessment and approving the providers that we think are the highest quality and likely to have the highest impacts uh, on, on pupil attainment. Okay, thank you. And Yalini? Thank you. So the academic mentoring programme is slightly different. Teach First are looking to uh, recruit and then train and place up to a thousand uh, academic mentors who work in schools um, as direct employees of the school. Uh, we've had about, or we're having just over 190 mentors uh, starting in school at the beginning of autumn two, and we'll have the remaining at uh, start in January and February as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, Robbie, I want to I want to put out this link to everyone um, in the newsletter. I was uh, I had quite a lot of responses. Um, Jack will also know uh, one or two uh, bits of challenge came through my social media feeds also. Um, so we're hoping to dispel some of those. But just can I, I first go to you, Robbie and ask: um, Is it just for disadvantaged students? Thanks, Ross. Um, so we think that disadvantaged students are, are likely to be particularly um, negatively affected by, by lockdown, but equally we know that um, every family experienced and has experienced the pandemic in a different way. So, so there's some flexibility from schools perspective um, in terms of selecting um, the, the pupils that, that will, um, will access um, tutoring, but in particular this program has been set up um, by, uh, by the charities involved to try and provide an extra boost um, for, for disadvantaged students who, who we think are likely to um, mm. have had a particularly um, negative experience of lockdown. And, and, and just to go one step further, um, we also recognise that that's, that's not the same thing as saying it's, it's only kind of low attainers. Um, that might be across the, the spectrum um, of, of attainment. But in particular, we think students um, who are eligible for the pupil premium, for example, um, are, are likely to, to need an extra boost going through this really difficult year. Um, and, and that's what the NTP has been set up to, to focus on. And, and Robbie, I know um, you know Boris Johnson's funding announcements. Is, is there funding set aside to support um, you know most able students, for example? Um, yeah, so the, the, the NTP is really targeted at, um, at, at students who are eligible for the pupil premium, and that's a, a, across the sort of spectrum of, of, of attainment, as I mentioned. Um, so it will be up to schools to select the, the type of tutoring that they think will be most beneficial. That might be via the, the academic mentors. Um, it might be via, for example, PhD students who, who are um, working with a, with a charity, um, supporting some, some really high attainers, preparing for exams, um, or it might be um, making sure you've got really experienced um, teachers who also work as supply teachers, um, providing an, an extra boost for, for students who um, perhaps are, are struggling with literacy at the start of secondary school. Sure. Um, so I'm going to come into some details in a moment, but um, for everyone watching, I'm going to just put a couple of surveys on your screen. Uh, so if you can just uh, send some responses through, just be nice to know um, who you are and the context in which you work. And then I'm going to activate a little survey myself outside of Zoom for your mobile phone devices, just to, for your chance to have a, I guess, a kind of um, free for all uh, response. So I'm just going to put these on your screen. I'm just going to give us all um, 30 seconds or so to respond to, uh, there should be four or five questions on there and then I'll put the results uh, on your screen. So in, in 30 seconds, I'll come back. Okay, so I can see results coming in. I'm on a split screen here, so I'm just going to make sure that you can actually see my slides. Um, so that would be a good check. And I'm also going to get, um, let's see, um, make sure that you can uh, see the results shortly. So I'm going to ping those your way. I can see we've had 81, 82 results. So I'll give you another 30 seconds, everybody. Hi, sorry, I can't seem to submit. Um, 
So you should be able to see the survey on your screen. I'll just make sure you can, uh, there should be able, yeah, you should be able to see that on your side. Yeah, I've got that. Um, I just can't seem to submit it. Okay, my apologies. I'll try another survey in a, in a, in a second, see if we have any luck with that. Or, or put your comments through on the, the chat box. They are all private responses. No worries, I'll do that. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to put the results up. Um, so I'm going to end the, the survey and just share those results with you. So hopefully you can uh, see these. If not, I shall make sure you can see them all. So we've got a good sense that the majority head teachers, school leaders and teachers, um, predominantly primary, secondary school. Um, most of you are saying that you're coping and you're working in a very challenging situation in terms of uh, catch up. And in summary, uh, question four, you're thinking about the tuition partners program. Some of you are thinking about both. Many of you are not sure. So that's why we're here. Um, and how you've heard about it and the interventions you're considering. So I'll make sure that I share all those results with you. I'm gonna try one more survey. Um, on the next screen, um, this one I need you to, um, let me just um, give you the instructions here on the screen. So I'm gonna stop sharing that last survey. So if you can go to this website, p-o-l-l-e-v.com, and then type in my uh, Twitter name, Teacher Toolkit, you will then start to get um, a little survey. Uh, and all I want is just one word. And we're just going to do a before and after, having stuck with us the whole session in terms of your concerns. So just put that in the chat box for everybody. Okay, and I'm going to just switch this screen so we can start to see people's responses. So the website you need on your mobile phone device or on another tab on your laptop screen is pollev.com forward slash teacher toolkit. So question I'm asking, what do you see is the greatest barrier to the National Tutoring Programme and its success. And let's see, so the more res res results we have, the larger the word. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hide the responses for now. I'm gonna give you another 10, 20 seconds, and then we'll see what your greatest issues are. And on that note, I'll just prepare Robbie with my next question uh, and I'll bring him in. And, you know, the National Tutoring Programme, Rob, Robbie, uh, you know, is it gonna be around just for COVID or, or what are the long-term long plans to help pupils catch up? Thanks, Ross. Um, so the National Tutoring Programme has, has been set up um, for, for this academic year, then in the entirety of the academic year. Um, but we think that, that tutoring um, has the potential to, to make a really long term impact on, on, on narrowing the gap. Um, and, and I guess one way to think about this is that as a system um, and as a country, we spend over a billion pounds a year on tutoring. Um, but that, that typically um, is, is targeted at, at families and, and, and pupils that can afford it. Um, and what the National Tutoring Programme is, is, is trying to do is to redress that balance. We want tutoring to be something that contributes to narrowing the gap rather than widening it, as, as is currently the case in, in England. OK, one billion pound. That's incredible. Um, Robbie, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to show you the results just as I see them myself and everyone else. Uh, and maybe I just get your first responses if that's okay. Um, so uh, there we've got quality and time. Uh, I've got no reason, uh, no idea why it's uh, much smaller. So I guess the, the, you know, some of the questions that I've received is you know, the vetting process, um, quality of tutoring, the safeguarding aspects. Are those some of the common messages that you're also hearing, Robbie? Definitely. And, and, and that's really, in a way, encouraging to hear. Um, so one of the insights that we had when we were setting up the NTP was that the tutoring sector um, and the tutoring that, that is on, on offer to schools sometimes is seen as a bit of a wild west. Um, and that's why we, we think it's really, really important that we can sort of go through a process of supporting schools to say, actually, these are the providers around the country um, that have a really strong evidence base, that have gone through the safeguarding checks and that train their tutors really, really well so that we can sort of present to schools and say, um, these are the approved providers on, on the tuition partner side. And actually, these are some mentors that have gone through a really rigorous selection and, and, and training process. 
Okay, thank you. So what we're going to do, everyone, I'm going to ask you a similar question at the end, once we get to the end of the webinar, and just compare your responses to your, your initial concerns. Uh, I'm going to ask Emily to come in now. We're just going to uh, get start getting into the detail. Emily, um, who are the tuition partners and how have you chosen them and when will the list be available for schools to see? So uh, three questions. Uh, who are tuition partners? How have you chosen them? And when will the list be available? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ross. Um, so really excitingly, we're just coming to the end of our process of selecting tuition partners and we expect to be able to tell people who the approved tuition partners are on the 2nd of November. So that's, that's a kind of really key date. So for schools interested in NTP tuition partners, look on the National Tutoring Programme website on the 2nd of November. We will have the list of approved tuition partners and all of the details about the, the approved tuition partners uh, up on the website then. So we, we, we are really happy with the portfolio we've got and we think we've got some uh, a kind of very strong group of um, providers to deliver NTP tuition partner tutoring. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of a bit of a detail about the process we've gone through. So to select tuition partners, um, actually probably the next slide is, is the best one. Thank you. So to select tuition partners, we ran an open and competitive funding call. We had an absolutely incredible response from across the education sector. And we had 389 applications from different organisations who wanted to be tuition partners. And that meant we were able to really kind of be very selective and just select those kind of uh, highest quality and, and best providers. But we had a kind of huge pool to choose from. Um, we assessed all of the applications against ev evidence informed quality standards. So that included kind of uh, how providers select their tutors and the training that they give tutors. Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of quality assurance processes that providers have in place to monitor delivery across across the lifetime of the project. Their kind of evidence of impact, so the evidence they have that they have a positive impact. Um, the experience they have of working with disadvantaged pupils. And also really vitally, the kind of communication plans they have to, to discuss the focus of tutoring with schools. So we know it's really important for schools to input um, on the kind of focus of sessions for pupils and to highlight the areas that pupils are particularly struggling with. So we, we assessed them against all of these quality standards. Um, we selected only those who, who are very high quality providers against those, those quality standards. We also assessed all of the bids for kind of value for money and reach and ensured that we don't have any kind of geographic cold spots across England. And once we had our, our preferred providers, we also undertook really detailed due diligence to check on that kind of financial management as organisations. Um, but really importantly, their kind of data protection and safeguarding practices. So we only accepted people who had exceptional kind of safeguarding practices. Um, so that's, that's the kind of process we've gone through. It's been a really uh, rigorous process over the last four, four weeks. So we feel like really confident that we've got really high quality providers and we hope kind of talking through that process also gives other people kind of confidence. I suppose two questions to you, Emily. When will the list be available? And are you confident that every area of England has, you know, some representation? Yeah, so the list will be available on the 2nd of November. So that's, that's the key date to look out for. Uh, the list will be on the National Tutoring Programme website. So, so go on there, you'll be able to search for providers by your kind of school name and also filter for different types of tutoring and so for example online versus face-to-face -face and different kind of subjects mm -hmm. um we we will definitely have coverage right across the country we've got a good proportion of national providers um but also what is really nice is we've got a, a good proportion of local and kind of uh, providers in each region so people can choose between kind of uh, very kind of local provision and also kind of more more kind of national provision. So I, I want to come on to the kind of practical practical aspects. H how is tutoring going to take place? You know, 
coming into school, you know, social distancing, will it be online, uh, in class, before school, after school? Um, what are the kind of plans and, and what subjects are on offer particularly? Yeah, so there's, there's going to be both face to face and online tutoring available and schools can kind of choose which model they would prefer. We also have providers who offer both. So in the, in the event of face to face not being possible, those providers can kind of move online and, and continue provision. We think that schools are kind of best placed to decide when tutoring should happen for their pupils. And so they should liaise with their kind of preferred tuition provider to organise session times. But we definitely expect sessions to be available both before and after school. But also because we know attendance can be an issue with before and after school, also during the school day, if that's when schools prefer tutoring to happen. Um, just a quick plug, we do have a guide for schools on getting the most from tuition partners on the National Tutoring Programme website, and that has suggestions around kind of scheduling of sessions. So um, yeah, that's on the National Tutoring Programme website. If people want to take a look at that guide, it, it provides hopefully some helpful advice to schools about, about these things. Okay, thank you, Emily. And I've got a couple of slides here for everyone, just in terms of the academic mentor overview. Um, I don't know if there's anything there that you just want to reference in these two slides, uh, Emily, and uh, also the subjects, subjects that are here. Um, an opportunity to respond to that. If not, I'll move on and ask Robbie my next question. Yeah, so actually, Yalini would be better talking through the academic mentors, the Education Endowment Foundations, looking after uh, tuition partners. But actually, just quickly on subjects, this is a really helpful slide because our subjects are the same across tuition partners and academic mentors. And as you can see, those subjects are maths, English, science, humanities, and modern foreign languages for key stage three and key stage four and primary numeracy and literacy and also for tuition partners primary science okay thank you i'm going to bring in uh, yolani um, here yolani can you tell everyone a little bit more about the academic mentors program on offer please so absolutely um thanks for us so the academic mentoring program is, is slightly different in in sort of the business model that we're providing essentially we're going to have trained graduates who are going to be employed directly by schools in the most disadvantaged areas to provide that really intensive support. In terms of the type of support that they can provide, it's about uh, really curriculum and school aligned work. So they'll be working really closely with classroom teachers to work out what, what's best for the pupils that, that schools are chosen for this. Um, and if we can actually go back to that previous slide for one second, <laughs> thank you. Um, It'll be very much subject specific. So those subjects that Emily mentioned are the same ones that we're running within the, the program. Uh, the, the type of work is one to one, one to small, small, uh, so a small group. Um, it could be re revision lessons. It could be sort of support for those pupils virtually who were shielding. In terms of the, the, the contracted hours of work, it's full time. However, schools and mentors can negotiate if that is before school, after school, evenings, weekends, or in fact during the day itself. But what we recommend is that that pulling pupils out of class needs to be done very, very carefully um, and, and methodically and for good purpose. So we're not recommending that that's the, the only approach, but we will support schools in trying to work out if it is and if they need some extra support with that. And the finer details on this slide, Jolini. Um... Absolutely, yeah. So uh, mentors that, um, that we recruit go through a really rigorous selection process. Once they come through at the end of that process, we start matching them. They'll do uh, up to two weeks of intensive training. If they have QTS, they'll do one week. If they don't have QTS, they'll do two weeks. But I want to be really clear that we're not saying that one extra week plugs the gap. What we're saying is that the, 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 the training that we provide sets the foundation for these mentors to go into school, build relationships with the pupils and the teachers, um, and then continue their learning process when they're in schools having that impact. We uh, will provide a very strong steer that it has to be disadvantaged pupils that these mentors are, are working with. The salary is £19,000 a year, fully covered by the government. Uh, there's, a, there's a rotor for reimbursements that has been published, so that's guaranteed for the full year. On costs need to be paid by the school, but it can come out of your uh, catch-up premium. They're, they're there full time, fixed term until the end of the academic year, and there are three start dates. Now we have had a small group of mentors go in for this first wave, and the reason for that is that we wanted to build a high quality program 
um, where we could uh, or balance high quality in terms of the, the mentors and the placements with getting things happening really quickly. So the bulk of the mentors are, are still to come. Um, and so we welcome schools to put their applications in for sure. Okay, thank you. So I can see lots of comments coming through the chat box thick and fast. Thank you, Yolini. I'm going to come back to Robbie uh, now. Robbie, um, how will, uh, you know, we like uh, a huge explosion of educational research um, across England at the moment. How is the extra support um, going to work alongside teaching? Um, will tutors know what's going on in the classroom? And then I'll come to the kind of evidence on tutoring shortly. Um, but just how is it going to work? Thanks so much, Ross. I mean, the, the, the number one, I think, principle that we've tried to work um, uh, to across both pillars of the, the National Tutoring Programme is this idea that, that the National Tutoring Programme is designed to be a, a tool for teachers. Um, so we know this is going to be a really, really difficult um, academic year. Um, and what we want to do is provide additional support to, to the teachers that are um, doing a, an incredible job and, and have been um, since March. Um, the way that that works um, is about making sure that there is, is guidance from, from the teachers about the areas in which um, tutoring would be most beneficial. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, starting this program after half term, I think is really important. We know that lots of assessment work, for example, has been going on in the first half term. Um, so that, that curricular alignment is really, really important. And, and, and I know as a, um, as a, when I was teaching English, um, that in some senses talking about tutors um, wasn't always helpful because it was somebody who had a different teaching method, who were, was, was teaching different um, strategies for how to write an essay, who might not be, be um, clued up in the exam board that we were using. And that's why from the NTP's perspective, it isn't about something separate. It's about um, the, the, the tutors really being guided by the teachers as to how they can be most useful. I guess the, the kind of cynical perspective from myself uh, and perhaps maybe others and, and you mentioned you referenced it there how, how will um tutors know what's going on in the classroom definitely well that's one of the reasons why um the assessment process that emily um and, and other colleagues in the eef have gone through is so important so one of the key assessment criteria is how much experience does this organization, this tutoring organization have of working with schools? And what are the processes that they're gonna put in place um, to, to make sure that that works? So all of the tutoring providers will have school liaison officers that are really responsible for making sure that when schools get in touch, they can have a really detailed conversation about what does the school need? Um, which kind of tutors um, will it work effectively with? And they can be a, a point of contact and an ongoing um, point of contact to make sure, for example, all the information about what sort of um, you know, COVID uh, security the school has in place um, is, is passed on to the tutor um, and, and that that is working really, really uh, smoothly. Okay, and now um, just referencing the Education Endowment Foundation, I know uh, in my own life as a, a deputy head teacher, uh, you know, going back, you know, six, seven, eight years, the, 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 the explosion of the research, you know, originally from the Pupil Premium Toolkit was really fun, uh, instrumental in shaping evidence and, and where best to put in your efforts. In terms of tutoring and evidence, what can you tell everyone um, listening, um, is there any evidence that online tutoring is effective in teaching children? Thanks, Ross. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the teaching and learning toolkit that you mentioned there was, was actually the, the project that I started working on um, at, at the EEF about 10 years ago with, with a, a team of academics up at Durham. Um, and what came through really consistently there was that the evidence base for both one-to-one -one and small group tutoring was, was exceptionally strong. Um, and the, the reason that this is the intervention we sort of turned to um, this year is that it's got a consistent evidence base um, at primary and at secondary level, but also it's something that you can um, scale up to, to large numbers relatively quickly. In terms of online, what we did um, working with, with a number of charities, um, so the EEF and, and, and Impetus and, and Nesta as well, um, was um, uh, to, to draw on some evidence um, about online tutoring and to actually pilot it. Um, so at the, the end of the summer term, um, and then over the summer, we worked with um, over 60 schools and over 1,300 children to test out whether or not online tutoring was, it was a promising way of providing some support during lockdown 
um, and over the summer. And the responses we got to that were really, really positive. So, so over 90% of the, the kids involved said that tutoring actually really helped them learn. Um, and it was really feasible um, for uh, providers to get that, that online tutoring up and running. And that's why we think this is a really good bet um, this year. The, the academic, or at least learning to be an academic in the, uh, is, is now seeking definitions. And I'm sure you work with the EEF, you've got all this covered. Uh, and I know for people listening, uh, primary and secondary, um, in terms of tutoring, you know, what, what, what are your insights with primary children or secondary children or perhaps people working with children in virtual schools or in PRUs? Is there any stronger differences than the other or, or can we kind of take away kind of strong recommendations for all aspects of tutoring and particularly online tutoring? Thanks, Ross. Um, so, so uh, in terms of primary versus secondary, I mean, one of the, um, the studies that the National Tutoring Programme um, looked really closely at when we were um, getting it set up is, is a study where some university students um, who, were, who were math students um, received some training and they worked with some primary schools um, in the northwest in the Manchester area. Um, and that, that um, uh, tutoring which was targeted at, at year five and six students had a really strong positive effect so we ran a very rigorous um, randomized control trial and that, that found a strong positive effect on, on math learning in primary schools. Another study um, which actually the academic mentors pillars really built on um, was about placing trained graduates um, in some, some schools in, in Birmingham and that was some secondary schools and again that had a strong positive effect um, and that was across maths and English. So we do think there are, there are examples of studies in England um, in primaries and secondaries where it's worked really effectively. In terms of online, we know the evidence base there is growing. So there's less evidence on online than there is face-to-face, -face, which is one of the reasons that we need a very strong evaluation built into the, the provision this year. But there is clear evidence of, of promise of online tutoring. And we know that actually online tutoring is um, one of the things that widened the gap during lockdown. So if you actually looked at the, the amount of online tutoring that was going on um, and the rates of it between different groups in, in society, um, there, was a, there was a strong increase in, in online tutoring, particularly for um, welfare families. And, and that, we think, widened the gap. Um, during school. There was one uh, I didn't particularly reference disadvantaged students. Uh, any insights there in particular for disadvantaged, you know, students maybe in virtual schools or in PRUs, for example, uh, not exclusively, but, um, you know, in terms of the evidence and definitions, uh, anything you can tell us there? Uh, definitely. So, so there are fewer studies in uh, virtual schools and in PRUs, um, but actually the model that I, I mentioned um, with, with primary schools in Manchester um, has uh, been tried out in, in some alternative provision schools and, and it's had some really promising um, initial findings. And the, the, the differential impact, so you mentioned uh, what is the impact on disadvantaged students. Actually, some of those studies um, that I mentioned have, have shown a particularly um, large impact on, on disadvantaged pupils. So we, we do think that as well as being a um, an approach that, that works across the board is a particularly positive effect for, for disadvantaged students, which is why we think this is such a strong bet. Okay, thank you, Robbie, for uh, answering all my uh, additional questions. Um, I'm going to ask Emily to come in here. Um, Emily, I can, I'm, I'm watching the chat box here, and the things that I'm seeing pop up are continuity, technical issues, you know, the technology, the Wi-Fi in some cases, the money and the time. Um, what sort of costs are we talking about for a single lesson, a group session, uh, and how do schools go about claiming uh, the 75%? Um, yeah, so firstly, obviously, schools can choose either face-to-face -face or online. So if, if for their pupils, they think it's going to be challenging for the people to do online, for whatever reason, um, or because of because of school technology, absolutely face to face will be an option. Um, we would expect all of this tutoring. Uh, you know, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We haven't got a crystal ball. So, if schools closed, obviously, moving online would be sensible. But at the moment, we're expecting all of this tutoring, including the online, to happen at school, uh, partly to remove any kind of tech technology barriers. Um, EF is going to pay 75% of the session costs direct to the group. Oh, I think, is someone trying to come in or, or is it's it just a, a bit of feedback? I think it's just a bit of feedback. Well, uh, I'll ask the, our, our uh, co-host just to just filter some of the microphones just for the benefit of everyone. 
Um, okay, I'm going to carry on. Yes. So EEF is going to pay 75% of the session costs direct to the approved tuition partners. And that so schools won't have to go through any kind of fiddly process to claim the 75% back. So the 75% will already be covered. They will just then so pay the... Straightforward. There's going to be no headaches for school leaders who are very time poor and don't have that uh, freedom and, and time to do these things. That will all be sorted for them. Yeah, so that's that's the hope with this model. That firstly, EF will have approved the quality based on kind of evidence standards and the other things we've gone through. So people won't have to worry about uh, checking that quality themselves because it's pre-done. Plus, we will prepay the 75%. So schools just pay the remaining 25%. Mm -hmm. There will be a range of costs depending on the model. So as we've said, we are funding a range of models. So one to one, one to two, one to three, face to face and also one-to-one, one-to-two, one-to-three online. So obviously one-to-three online is, is gonna be the cheapest, but then there are some providers who will provide much more specialist one-to-one -one tutoring for pupils with SEND or pupils in alternative provision. Mm -hmm. um, and that will be the kind of most expensive uh, model. Just, I think it's helpful to give people a sense of cost. Um, yeah, I was just gonna ask you that. What, what are we talking about here? What, what is the price? So as I said, there is a range, but I, I also know it's helpful to give people a, a cost. So I want to give people a kind of sense of the average cost. Mm -hmm. So on average, it will be uh, around £400 for a 15 hour block. So that, that comes to £26 an hour per pupil with schools kind of paying 25% of, of that cost. So just to clarify, £26 per hour on average, the school would pay 25% of that £26? Yeah, so on average, it's £26 per hour per pupil, because obviously some groups are one to three, with both schools paying 25% of that. And the, with the school only paying a quarter of the cost? Exactly. And across all models, if you want a more specialist provision, it would be more expensive, as we said, um, but you would still only pay 25% of the cost. And, and a total of the 15 hours. Uh, I, I guess a kind of a, a question from me, um, can I choose how to spread that those 15 hours? How much of that is directed or free, free range? Yeah, I'd say the 15 hours comes very much from, from the evidence base, which suggests you need at least 12 hours to have, have the impacts that we're talking about. Uh, and we, we realise attendance might not be kind of 100%, so that's where the kind of 15 hours comes from. We want... I think this goes back to one of your other questions actually Ross about kind of sustaining we want people to have sustained blocks of 15 hours from the same tutor mm -hmm. um, and we suggest that this is done kind of in subsequent weeks so we think the best way of getting the most from this is to have 15 hours over 15 weeks however we also recognize that for primary pupils an hour's tutoring is, is a long time and um, so for those schools might choose to, for example, split it into half an hour blocks and have two half an hour blocks a week um, for older children or where this is appropriate. People might suggest having one and a half hour blocks, particularly kind of before an exam and, and obviously having fewer blocks, but still having the 15 hours. Sure. Now I'm going to throw in an extra question to you here, Emily. Um, you know, we, we should never assume safeguarding common sense practice. And I know you're going through a, a rigorous vetting process, which you've already explained. And, you know, with, um, with self-isolation already taking place, you know, put, put lockdowns in different parts, where the face-to-face -face switches to online delivery, can you just reassure um, people watching um, you know, kind of the, the expectations of tutors and some of the things that you are recommending or, or have vetted, uh, just for kind of reassurance and clarity for people who are still uh, not sure if this is something they're going to buy into. Yeah, that's a really good question. So for online providers, we had a higher bar um, in terms of safeguarding. So we had, we had a kind of higher bar that they needed to pass mm -hmm. and they needed to have specific practices for kind of safer online delivery. Um, so, so we have put them, as you say, through this kind of rigorous process, checked they, they meet up to the bar. Um, obviously, schools should also follow their own safeguarding practices and also the attrition partners they select will be able to provide their safeguarding practices to schools. And obviously, as with all providers in schools, schools should um, 
make sure they see those and make sure they're kind of happy with them. But we're happy that they're meeting a kind of very high um, high standard. Okay, thank you, um, Emily. Uh, Yarlini, I'm going to bring you in for a couple of questions here. Oh, can I just come in quickly? Of I've had some, there's been some questions in the chat and they're, they're mostly directed about tuition partners. So I think it would be helpful to Sure, I don't know if it's uh, everyone else, but your microphone is getting a bit static, Yolani, so you might need to just... I... I'm going to cut you, cut you up. I can't hear you. Uh, you're going to have to repeat all of that, Yolani. It's actually Liberty that's speaking. Oh, it's Liberty. Oh, it's one from Abby that says... Uh, if the tuition okay. provider isn't on the list, um, but it's okay, I'm going to have to um, interject here. Um, Liberty, uh, whoever's um, talking through, I can't hear. Sorry, my internet's not really working. Post some questions um, through the chat box, and we'll try and answer those questions at the end. I do apologise, um, Yalini, if you're still there. Um, we've spoken quite a lot about the tutor side of the programme. Can yeah. you give me a bit more of an explanation of the academic mentoring programme and how it will work and how many mentors will be available in the school? Absolutely. So, uh, as I mentioned before, across the year, we're looking to place uh, between 1,000 and 1,500 mentors um, in all regions of the country. Each school can apply for up to two mentors, and that just means that we're able to make sure there's equity and a uh, spread of that resource. Um, so these uh, mentors are going to come to the school essentially with all of the, the recruitment processes tidied up. They will have been uh, vetted through a rigorous selection process. The DBS will have been completed. We will have done various checks and things like that um, and, and sort of deliver the mentor uh, hopefully to, to the door. Um, mm -hmm. They'll be able to um, uh, essentially work in whatever way the school deems fit. So it may be that some schools say, actually, we, we want you to do some virtual support if that's the case, because the mentor is employed by the school directly, the school would just provide um, whatever technology is required to do that virtual support. Equally, if the, if the mentor is working in schools, um, what would happen is that the line manager um, or the classroom teacher they're assigned to, they would have some dedicated time to get to know each other, get to know the pupils and make sure the mentor is working in a really curriculum aligned way. What Teach First will do though, once we've done the initial training and then and then the mentor starts school, we'll provide um, ongoing training throughout the year. So monthly training sessions that'll be in a variety of really accessible ways, sometimes pre-recorded lectures, sometimes synchronous sessions that are live like this. Um, and that training is going to be responsive to the mentor needs. And the way that we'll find that out is that once the mentor starts school, they'll have their line manager in school that will support them, but they'll also have a dedicated support role within Teach First. That person is called their curriculum and training lead. They're going to be catching up with the mentors at least once a month, if not more, depending on what the mentor needs and making sure that there is a really good flow of communication between the line manager in school, the curriculum and training manager at Teach First and the academic mentor. So, we're seeking to make this as easy as possible for schools to get the mentor in, but then we're not just letting go after that. We're saying, whilst the mentor is the school's employee, we're still here to meet those additional training needs throughout the year until until they finish their placement. Well, and you mentioned the graduates. What, what kind of people have been applying and, and you going through the vetting process? Um, and how do you imagine them working in the school? I know you've kind of picked on that just there, but um, what yeah. kind of uh, people are we seeing uh, part of the programme? We're seeing a real range of people actually. So we're seeing some really, really high caliber graduates who have come out of university um, and who are really passionate and excited about education, but perhaps not quite ready to do teacher training just yet. And so they're wanting to get involved. They're wanting to help during this really difficult time. So they're really eager to, to learn. As a point of interest for, for this group of the 190 odd mentors that we just had in training, we only had about three or four miss a session here or there, and that was for reasons that we, we knew about. So these are people who are dedicated to learning and dedicated to helping. We also have people who have QTS, who, uh, who haven't got teaching jobs this year or who are uh, taking a bit of a break from teaching, for example. Um, and then we've also got people who are really experienced teachers who've 
previously gone into retirement and then seen that there's been a huge need for support in the sector and they're bringing all of their experience. So we've got a huge range. What we're guaranteeing is Teach First is that they will all have the, the, the fundamental knowledge and skills to get into schools and get stuck in. And then we'll keep topping up that, that additional support where, so for example, there's no doubt that someone who's got 30 years experience teaching, who's just retired and come back in, they're going to probably have, have, have an easier time settling in than perhaps a graduate who's, you know, who's new to the, to the game. And so our job, our, our curriculum and training leads job, teach first job here is to make sure that, that uh, all of those mentors have the support that they need to, to have the impact that we know that they can have once they're in school. Sure. Um um, so uh, quite a fascinating uh, body of work that you've done. Um, I'm just reading the chat boxes also in terms of, you know, we've already talked about the cost. You've got the salary there on the screen. that you, yep. you're money. What, Are there any kind of hidden costs on costs uh, for the school, for the individual? So the salary is set at £19,000 a year and that is fixed. Now, if schools want to pay their mentor more, they're really welcome to, but the, what will be reimbursed is that £19,000. The ESFA has just published a bulletin last week outlining the, the exact payment schedules. The on costs, that's your all your um, national insurance and all that, all that wonderful stuff, that does come out of, uh, so the school's responsible for paying that, but it comes out of the COVID catch-up premium. So... Uh, when, when you add those things together, it shouldn't touch your, your actual your normal school budget. Mm -hmm. um, and and your, the mentor is an employee of the school, so they are subject to the same benefits and the same conditions as any other employee. So, you know, if you give all your support staff a, and teaching staff a laptop, you're going to need to give your, your mentor a laptop too, so they can do their job as best as possible. Uh, yeah. The training is all part of the package. There's no additional cost for that um, uh, at all. Do you have any, uh, I guess, a, a, a pie in the sky type question, but, um, you know, if you think a large secondary school in a, in a city across England, what yeah. are your expectations of number of tutors and mentors they might buy into? If we take a student population, maybe 1500 mm -hmm. children and uh, 100 adults, um, have you got a kind of model of what you think or hope people will be signed up to? So each school can have a maximum of two mentors. Okay. And I think that that's the number that we, you know, between DfE and, and, and the National Teaching Programme, we came up with that because it, because we wanted to make sure we could spread the resource. And I think we need to see how that goes this year. Um, that now, there isn't uh, necessarily at this stage a, a particular sort of cap on the tuition partner. So potentially a school of that size, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's open to kind of have the best of both worlds, essentially. They could have their, if we can find, and I need to be really clear about this, we, when we talk about matching a, a mentor to a school, we're talking about finding somebody that has the right phase specialism, the right subject specialism, and that lives within traveling distance to the school. So those are some pretty, um, uh, I suppose those are, those are uh, uh, indicators or factors that we have to work around and sometimes it can be challenging. If we can work with that and get you two mentors into the school, it might not be enough and, and then that's okay we can hope we would then direct you to have a look at tuition partners and see what kind of top up there is the other thing as well is that we we hope we advocate teach first we very much feel this program needs to continue for, for longer as well and when we look at the extension of the program it'd be fantastic to look at whether or not this model has worked and what needs to change um going forward um, thank you, Yolani. Uh, Robbie, I'm going to bring you in now. Now, I've talked about some of the criticism. I'm actually going to uh, put on this live survey for everybody. So before I show the results, uh, if I just remind everyone, back on your devices, um, if you could go to polev.com forward slash teacher toolkit or go to polev.com and then type in teacher toolkit. Um, at the start of the session, obviously, um, one of the questions asked, are you considering using... Uh, the interventions. Some of you wanted things clarified. Many of the issues, the technology, the vetting process, safeguarding the continuity, the time. So know what you know now. Is there one word that sums it up? And I'm going to bring Robbie on now to talk about some of the criticisms that he's seen and heard, and then we'll reveal some of your results. I can see the results already coming in in the bottom right hand corner. And then we'll see if we can catch Robbie off guard here, but he's, he's well mastered in these types of things. So Robbie, um, initial criticism that you've been receiving. Thanks, Ross. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think one of the things is, is, is an incredibly challenging time. And we know that the expectations and the need in the system is, is, is huge. Um, and in a way, there's an urgency. Um, and, and 
one of the things that some um, schools might say is, well, why don't you just give us the money directly and, and, and we'll, we'll find our own um, tutors? And that's certainly been one of the, um, the questions that, 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 that I think is, is right to answer. Um, I think the reason um, for, for why we've um, taken the approach we have at the, the INTP is, is, is twofold. One is that we know that there's, there's a huge amount of um, logistics and a huge amount of checking um, done to sort of wade through this, this wild west um, and all of the work that, um, that Emily set out about um, vetting these providers um, is designed to save schools time in a really, really difficult um, and, 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 uh, year. The second point is about geographical spread. So we know that actually there are certain parts of the country where you can access tutoring. So if you're in London um, and, and you're a young person, the chance of you having had tutoring are actually a little bit over half. So about 52 percent of, of uh, students in, in London have had tutoring. If you go to the north uh, of England, it's half of that. Um, so there's this regional divide and there's this access problem um, that we've had um, for many, many years. And, and what we think the National Tutoring can try and do is, is spread that and even that out and actually make sure that in, in parts of the country where actually um, it's been really hard to, to, to access this, um, this approach that we know is very effective, um, it, it hasn't been, um, that hasn't been available. So that's what the, the NTP is, is in part trying to do. I've tried to put it onto a positive there. If I come back to the kind of uptake you've had from people applying and, and you say you've got that um, wide distribution across the country, can, can I just ask for reassurance that that is the case? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've, we've been really, really struck um, by the, the number of schools uh, registering on our website. So we're spending out a weekly um, national tutoring programme bulletin and now it's going out to about uh, 18,000 um, subscribers every week, which probably doesn't hit your your stats yet, Ross, but um, we think it's, it's, it's pretty good in, a, in, in quite a, a new programme. So I'd really encourage um, any of your listeners go on the, the National Tutoring Programme um, website and register because we actually do think the demand is going to be is really high and we, and we want schools, particularly um, in really um, deprived areas of the country, to, to know about the programme and to be able to access it from, uh, from the get-go. Uh, now I'm going to put on all the emails and web addresses for everyone shortly. So Robbie, here we go. I'm going to put you off guard. Here, here are the responses. We've got 53 replies. Um, I'm just going to change the settings to a word cloud. So here we've got. So we've got. Um, again, I have no idea why this is uh, smaller than expected, but we've got interesting, hopeful, optimistic, confused. So the the, the larger the words um, are, uh, have been resp uh, responses from. Uh, people uh, taking part. If I just uh, put some of these comments here for you, um, Robbie, just to respond to one or two of them as they come through. Um, how can you reassure someone that still finds all this a bit daunting? Definitely. I mean, I, I think one of the things that I would really say is um, go and have a look and, and get into the information. We know that absolutely it's right that you make a really considered decision. Um, but um, I hope particularly on, on the 2nd of November after half term, when you'll be able to go and have a look, for example, at the, the tuition partners page and you'll see um, who's out there and, 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 and what's on offer in your area, um, that that extra information will, will help schools make, a, make an informed decision. And, and, and as I say, um, we think that this is something that, that's designed to support teachers and, um, and, and we know from, from many of the pilot studies and and previous re bits of research um, that have gone on that, that that's happened, but we want to widen that opportunity now at, at, at this point. And I'm reminded of um, Lee Elliott Major, who you'll know very well, Steve Higgins' her book, What Works? It's not what you do, it's the way that you do it that matters, to coin their Bananarama phrase. And uh, I'm just looking at some of the comments coming through. You know, there's a good range of uh, positive to negative on the spectrum, but I think there's a real opportunity for us all to make a bit of a positive difference on our disadvantaged kids. So I would encourage you all um, to at least investigate if you're still unsure. Um, I'm just gonna finish with the last couple of slides if I can start, stop this survey. I know Jack's already put it in the contact um, box for you all, but there is um, the contact email address. Um, so I can just ping that back through in the chat box for you all. Um, and the website, uh, I will get that on to you now. So here it is there. And um, that's the website. So the nationaltutoring.org.uk. Um, I'm going to just spend a moment just going through the chat box, but ultimately we're finished. And I'm going to kind of call it a five minute early finish, which is good for everyone's mental health. Um, sorry for the little technical sound glitch in the middle. Um, thank you for all for signing up and participating. Uh, I know many of you watching, uh, you'll be either on half term at home uh, teaching remotely or some of you have made uh, towards the end of your first 
half term like you've never ever known before in your entire teaching career so from me um, I'm wishing everyone um, a happy uh, half term and much needed rest uh, I just want to say thank you to all everyone taking part behind the scenes and particularly uh, you know Mark, Liberty, Jack and uh, behind the scenes help involve the admin side here so these things um, are a lot of work to get these things uh, available to you and to Robbie, Emily and Yolini for uh, your contributions and your, your, your bearing me with my some ad hoc questions uh, thrown your way. Um, I don't know if you've got your Halloween costume planned for next weekend, at least it might be a virtual one for many of us, but I hope you're going to do something uh, to, 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 to relax and I hope this national tutoring programme will make a difference to your pupils. Um, other than that, um, I'm going to uh, officially say good night. Um, thank you for watching. I'm just going to monitor the chat box and just put in some or two, one or two responses. But from me, you're free to go and I hope to see you again. So all the best for me. And again, thank you to all our guests. Ross? Hello there. Hi, it's Jenny Cassidy from Chilwall School in Liverpool. Hello. Um, I don't know if you can help me. I did put it on the chat. I've put in for an academic mentor um, and I've had an, uh, a letter back, uh, an email back, sorry, recently just to say that we've been unsuccessful on this round. And obviously because of the numbers are quite low, I can see why. Um, do, do you know if we have to reapply for the second round or I'll, once we're um, in? I'll ask one of our co-hosts either to, to talk to you privately or maybe they can just signpost you to something here now to give you a kind of answer to your... I can um, probably just, I, I managed to catch that just before I, I clicked leave. Um, <laughs> answer that really quickly and say you don't need to reapply. You're absolutely, the school is still in the same pool. All that, okay. is that we would, we wouldn't have been able to find somebody that had the subject specialism, the phase specialism and could travel to your school. So you're still okay. in the placeable pool and we're already working on trying to rematch um, or trying to find you a match for, for January, um, but you don't need to do anything. Can I just one more thing? Yeah. When you look at the context of our school, yeah. um, do you look at the, the, the kids that we get in or where our postcodes? Because actually our postcode doesn't reflect the context of the kids. Uh, Does that make sense? Uh, yes, but it might be something. Can I, can I? This is going to sound like I'm trying to fob the question. I'm not. No, not at all. The reason it takes longer for me to for answer than I would like. The best thing to do to get a really direct response is to email the academic mentoring at Teach First email address. So that's managed by our school's team. And they'll be able okay. to that one there. Uh, it's not that one actually, Ross. I'll put it in the. I'll put it in the in the, in the chat box. Yeah. Chat box. Mentoring. Okay, and if there's anyone else still watching with any questions, uh, I'll stay on the line. I'm going to go through all the chat box and then I'll try to answer as many as I can in the follow up um, recording. So I'm going to send a recording to you first thing tomorrow. So thank Thanks, you. For questions. My pleasure. Take care. Thanks, Yolini. Um, any other questions from anyone? Now's your chance to grab me or any of our hosts still on the line. Otherwise, it's time to put your feet up. Uh, put the mark into one side. And, Just uh, drop that email address in there for. Right, lovely. Thanks very much. Yeah, there it is. Academic mentor. Oh, Thanks right. very much. I've screenshot it. I'll go. No <laughs> Thanks, right, everyone. Take care. Thanks for your time. Bye. Bye bye. Um, so people putting questions in the chat box, I am going to go through them all and I will try uh, and reply um, either in a kind of sequence of uh, facts, being uh, some frequent asked questions. Uh, when I send the video out tomorrow, uh, but I'm just going to kind of stay on the line and try and go through many of the comments. But um, if you don't have anything pressing to be answered right now, it's 20 hours. Um, there's my little um, alarm for eight o'clock. Um, so I'm going to hang up. But if you've got any more questions, now's your time. If you want to put something through your voice, through your microphone. Um, otherwise, I shall um, mute, say goodbye. And I'll start to just go through the chat box for two or three minutes and then I'll reply to you in the morning. Um, have a lovely half term, everybody.